This edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by SaneBox, the way to take control of your out of control email. For a 14 day free trial and $10 credit, visit SaneBox.com slash Mac Voices. Welcome to Mac Notables on Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Mac community. I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, ready for Valentine's Day already? Uh, Bob, Dr. Maclevitis. Bob, what, what are you doing, Bob? <laughs> You've changed, Bob. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm just having fun fun with filters. Yeah. <laughs> you, you put me on a video camera. I got to play. Yeah, you got to play. I think the hearts were the best, though. I like that. You like the hearts? Um, I like the I like the little birdies. Well, the birdies. The little yeah. tweety birds? Yeah, the birds, too. I'll bring yeah. them back. There oh, you go. That's cool. <laughs> in your sound effect. <laughs> uh, or you can put that in post. Well, either one. I, no, I think it should stay right here. I really do. <laughs> So, Bob, you're the first one that I've been able to talk to um, who was on stage at the 30th anniversary bash for the Macintosh. Well, those other old geezers in my band are all still recuperating. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I thought it was just fantastic that the Macworld All-Star Band was asked to, to play at this event. I, that was just such a nice touch, and it really showed that the people who organized this kind of get the whole Mac community thing. Well, I have to tell you, I was surprised. <clears throat> we were all surprised. The band was surprised. And I know that we were all very honored to have been invited to open the show. I mean, it was just great to be in that building for that. Um, and, and to be invited to be part of it, it was, it was great. I mean, it was just a nerd dream come true. We had a great night. I mean, it was fun to play for those people. It's funny, if you look at the little video that I put up on my Facebook, Dave says, your wife's a really good photographer. Look, she got John Scully sitting down while you were singing. And and sure enough, if you look, a guy walks up and sits down in the second or third row, and it is John Scully, I'm pretty <laughs> sure, in the video of while I'm playing, listen to, my, listen to her heart. Well, now, we, for the folks who didn't hear about this or didn't didn't get there, and a lot of us didn't get there, give us a quick rundown on on who all was there, what kind of presentations were done, what you know, what it was really all about. Yes, it was um, the it was an event <clears throat> staged at the uh, Flint Center in Cupertino, which is where Steve pulled the first Mac out of the bag in 1984. Um, and it was almost 30 years to the date from that day. It was, I think, two days off. Uh, and it was, it was billed as a celebration of the Mac's 30th birthday. And they, the uh, kind of the, the focus of it was to bring the original Mac team, the 120-some people that, that worked on the Mac from 1981 forward, um, to try to reunite all as many of them as possible on stage. They took a group photo of them um, and to honor them and, you know, to just kind of say, uh, hey, you know, I don't know if you, you knew you were going to change the world, but, yeah, you know, this hundred people was pretty responsible for a, a revolution in using computers. I know for me, before the Mac came out, I was I was a guy who said, Computers are great. You hire people and they run them for you. You tell them what you want and they do it. I, why would I want to learn how to use a computer? You know, I just couldn't understand why I would ever touch one. Um, I failed my college Fortran class. And I really thought computers were, you know, a great thing that somebody else could go do. And I never expected to see them, you know, in my life, much less become my life. Um and the Mac did that because the Mac, and I can't remember who said it. It might have been Rod Hold. I don't know. Somebody said um, the reason the Mac is good is because we weren't building it for you. We we're building it for us. And the other thing that came across was there's been kind of a uh, one, like, inalienable fact about Macs that Apple has never let go of, and that is that they should be easy enough to use that you could walk up and get something done without a manual. <clears throat> and, you know, you could say maybe that's not so true anymore, but it's still pretty true. 
And the same thing for an iPhone and an iPad and all of Apple's products. Their human interfaces are designed to give you cues, to, to help you figure out how to use something you've never used before without having to go consult a manual. And that's pretty magical. You know, it's like the, the, Steve Hayden showed a bunch of ads, and one of them was the one where the IBM guy, you know, the PC guy is in the office, and he's got a stack of manuals this high. And then they say, this is the Macintosh. And they throw a thing about that thick out. This is the manual. It's the truth, you know? It's, it's um, not very many products are, have been around for 30 years, you know? Really, the PC that you get today isn't much of the PC that you got in 1984. But the Mac, you can definitely see that heritage, you know, even though it's, it's matured. Um, a lot of things about it have remained, you know, it sounds like kind of fanboyish, but magical. I sit down at my Mac sometimes, and, and I'm just blown away by the things I can accomplish that when I was younger... I never believed I would be able to do, like editing video on my desk, you know, sitting here editing high-def video on a personal computer, mixing audio, being able to record my band without a studio, without $300 an hour engineer, you know, uh, these are magic things to me. And Photoshop, being able to, you know, deface pictures. How much <laughs> is that worth? used to be that, you know, airbrushing was expensive and required super talented artists. Today, anybody with enough, uh, uh, enough time and, and stick-to-itiveness can do anything to a picture in Photoshop, you know? I can make you look like uh, Dean Martin. I, go you right, do kind of look like Dean Martin. Go right ahead. Yeah, I, I didn't put the tux on tonight, but other than that... And I, and I don't have a drink, so. <laughs> I do. It's a refreshing ginger ale. Uh, well, yeah, I do have a drink. It's just water. Um, That's what Dean Martin drank. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we were talking about this, this event that we, we got to open. We played six songs. And it's the, the Flint Center is this beautiful, about 2,500-seat theater with, uh, you know, mezzanine and a balcony and uh orchestra and you know big stage big proscenium stage and it was uh, certainly the biggest room we've ever played the macro law stars and um frankly we've never played in front of people who weren't drunk and dancing so <laughs> it was kind of weird to see people just kind of sitting in their seats you know bobbing their heads uh it was different from a Cirque de Mac but it was exciting, and, and we got to afterwards, you know, once we got our gear off the stage, I missed about half of the panel that followed right after us. Uh, I heard it because I was backstage, but I didn't get to see it. Um, there were three panels. They had – I have some notes here. Hold on. And I'll, so I, I make sure I get all the names. But, boy, there were a lot of people from the original Mac team. Um, let's see. Oh, first they showed some video from Boston Computer Society, 1984. Did you see that you saw it on the web? Because yeah. they posted a piece of it. Well, we saw like five minutes of it at this event, and it was Steve Jobs introducing the Mac to the Boston Computer Society, and then Bill Atkinson demoing MacPaint, and then Randy Wigginton demoing MacWrite. How cool is that? These are these guys let out of the office for the first time to show it in public. I think it was the first time. I mean, Steve brought it out of the bag at the Flint Center, but I think this was the first uh, demo to geeks, you know, to users, to, to the, the people who they wanted to show it to. And they are so excited. They're giddy <laughs> doing this presentation. And they do a great, slick presentation. You can see the Steve showmanship even there. You know, you can see that he said, then show them this. And then say, but wait. There's one more thing. You know, is it, you could kind of hear the pacing. Steve was a master, and he was good. He, you know, he took the Mac out of the bag and it wanted to speak for itself. Let me turn this over to a man who's been like a father to me, Steve Jobs. Come on, you know. It, it doesn't get any better than that. <clears throat> they showed that, and then uh, 
the audience, you know, they had never seen copy and paste. They had never seen take a picture and paste it into a text document. They had never seen print by pulling a menu down and choosing print or clicking a button. You know, this is, this is an audience that there was no windows. There was no, you know, the only people who knew about clicking buttons were people who worked at Xerox, where Apple stole the idea. Real artists ship. No, real artists steal. So the first panel was called Conception, had the original Mac team um, members, Larry Tesler, Dan Kaike, Rod Holt, Jerry Manick, uh, Mark LeBrun, and Bill Fernandez. Oh, this is like employees number one, two, three. No, I guess Steve was zero because Waz wanted to be one. So, so Job said, I'll be zero then. <laughs> Um, and I think Fernandez was number two, and maybe Kotke was three or four. I mean, these guys were the guys that were in the garage. This was before they had an office, before they went public, before they were Apple IIs. These guys, they go way back. And, and they talked about why the Mac shipped in a sealed case, which I thought was pretty interesting. Not that I didn't know, but it was because there were too many support calls for the Apple II for peripherals that Apple didn't make. You know, they'd get calls for mouse drivers and for uh, tape tape interfaces and modem cards. And Apple was getting the tech support calls for them, and it was killing them. And Steve said, well, if we don't let them do that stuff. Now, Jeff Raskin wanted to go even further. Jeff Raskin wanted to sell you a sealed box with no disk drive and no way to put new stuff on it. He wanted it really sealed because then it would never break. And there's some equity to that, too. But... As, as uh, I think Apple found out, this isn't something that you can just make the rule and let it, let it live like that. At some point, they realize people, you know, need to do RAM upgrades or swap out a hard drive every once in a while. And while they haven't always made it easy for us, it's a lot easier now than it was on the Mac Plus, where you had to have a Torx screwdriver with a 17-inch shank to get the screws out. They were sunk in a 16-inch hole. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. You had to have the long torque screwdriver that only two companies sold, and they were like 30 bucks. And, and then, of course, as soon as you did that, you broke the warranty, so you, you had no coverage. And uh, it was a, you know, I understand the business case for it, but it didn't last that long. I think by the, by the Mac 2, we were at, you know, slots and open, open architecture. And then, um, yeah, they talked about Jeff Raskin and the, the first Macintosh Vision, which was something like a toaster. You took it out of the box, and it did a few things, and that's it. It typed and it you know, drew. No networking, remember. We had no networking. Like Networking was five years after the Mac came out, or six years. Certainly not till the... Well, I think there was local talk to some extent so you could print. But I don't think that there was, you know, networking as we know it, Ethernet and, you know, um, local area networks with peer-to-peer -peer sharing and stuff. And uh, somebody said, yeah, we were just so excited about everything else. We kind of missed the networking thing. And it kind of, you know, the, the businesses needed that kind of took us by surprise because up until that point, you know, it was you, you were sitting with a acoustic coupler and it was horribly slow and it was for super geeks only and nobody was thinking you know hey someday you're just gonna turn on your computer and the internet will be there there was no internet there was CompuServe $24 an hour yeah I should own that company for all the money I gave them you and me both yeah um so that was the first panel, and then the second panel was The Birth of the Mac, which was moderated by Stephen Levy from Wired Magazine, who uh, wrote the first big feature story about the Mac for Rolling Stone. And he was embedded at Apple before the Mac shipped. And he was given a carte blanche to talk to anybody he wanted about anything he wanted. Steve just gave him free reign to get to know the team and write a story and trusted that he'd you know, do, do a good job. So Steve has some, you know, some real long-term insight into this whole thing because he knew these guys before they were rock stars, you know, when they were just, when they were locked in a closet, 90 hours a week and loving it. They had t-shirts. And Carolyn Rose said, 
I didn't work 90 hours a week. Um, I can't do that. I worked about 60, and I didn't love it that much, but I wouldn't wear the T-shirt. <laughs> So the second panel was uh, Atkinson, Wigginton, Andy Hertzfeld, Bruce Horn, George Crow, Carolyn Rose. It's like these are all the people that put the put the goodies in your Mac, the first Mac. These are the people that wrote really the lion's share of the code that made the Mac work. And Carolyn wrote inside Macintosh. That's an accomplishment. Let me tell you, to be able to write, see, writing what I write, you know, like for dummies books, isn't that hard. Because I'm writing for regular people, and I'm writing at a, a eighth grade or ninth grade English level, and there's no special skill set necessary. Writing for developers or programmers, you not only have to get everything just right, you have to say it in a way that they'll understand or they'll tune out and not read it. And so, you know, Inside Macintosh had almost a sly sense of humor about it, um, but it wasn't written like other technical manuals. It wasn't just the instructions, type this, this will happen, type this, this will happen. It was more like, you know, hey, step back and look at the system, you know, look at the big picture, look at the way the pieces work together. And she, she just, you know, tech writing like that, that's, a, that's an art. What I do, you know, it's like sausage. Grind it out. <laughs> So then there was an intermission, and after the intermission, they took a big picture of all the guys, 100 people on stage. They had a crane on stage with the camera on it so they could get that, you know, great everybody looking up into the camera shot. Uh, and then uh, Steve Hayden from Chai at Day came out. So originally they had said that Ridley Scott was going to come and talk about 1984, and he was stuck in London. So Steve Hayden from Chai at Day, he's... Uh, I think he wrote the copy for 1984. I'm pretty sure it was his idea. He conceived it um, and sold it to Steve. And, you know, a lot of other uh, advertising campaigns since then also. And so he talked about 1984. And then he showed some commercials that, you know, maybe we hadn't seen. And he showed some some stuff that didn't make it out of the testing. And it was a great he is a great speaker. And that was fascinating. And if that could have gone on for another hour, the audience would have been just fine. <clears throat> Unfortunately, when you're in a building like that, I think um, they pay, you pay by the hour. So at some point, it starts costing money to go longer. And so the, the third panel was called The Coming of Age of Mac. And the event was already running way, way, way late. And this was another good panel with um, Charlie Jackson from Silicon Beach Software, Jim Rhea from uh, Panorama, uh, ProView, uh, Ty Roberts, Mark Cantor, Macromind Director, um, Steve Jasek, Macnozzi. These are all people that had like, uh, and somebody from ClickArt, uh, TeamMaker. Heidi Roizen was supposed to be there and she was sick. But really, these were people who all had product out within a month of the Mac. These were the first developers. I mean, the only one that wasn't there that was an early developer was Microsoft. And, and those guys got short. They got shafted because the time was running short. The moderator, uh, who was the moderator of that one? Um, I don't remember who moderated that. But anyway, uh, he was told to tell the speakers they could tell one really short story and then they'd have to pass the microphone. And it, it was kind of sad because they didn't really get to say much, uh, none of them. And a couple of them didn't get to talk at all because they were hustling them off stage. They read a letter, a touching letter from the original Mac team to the Mac on its 30th birthday. And there's a copy of it. You can, there's a link at the Mac at 30 website and you can read the whole letter. But it, it was very nice. And, and, you know, there it was. At, at, we went on stage at uh, quarter to seven, and at like 10.15, it was over. And I think everybody was sad that it was over. I know a lot of us milled around out there for a good 20, 30 minutes. They finally kicked us out. They finally told us we had to leave the theater. But it was a once-in-a-lifetime event. I mean, I, I don't know that you'll ever see that many of those original Mac team members in the same room at the same time again. And... Uh, Certainly never going to see him with, with that kind of, you know, event being, being honored for something they did that, that has, you know, stood the test of time. 
It's 30, and it, it takes a licking, and it keeps on ticking, the Mac. It's hard, it's hard to believe, Bob, 30 years. And all the things you were just describing, I, I don't know how to compare it to, you know, what this generation that is adopting the Mac and using the Mac and iPads and iPhones, you know, they, they're never going to feel the magic any more than we probably felt the magic of, you know, television. That was already, you know, coming along when pretty well. When, yeah. when, no, that was you know, already part of my life. When yeah. I was born, there was TV. Yeah. And this but is the part kids of their today life. don't know. Yeah. They don't. My kids have a hard time remembering before the internet. You know, it's like to them, the internet's kind of always been in the wall somewhere. Or in the air, and and it, it is. You know, I wonder. I I, I say, um, events like the personal computer, and, and you know, I'd like to say the Macintosh, but let's just say the personal computer to be fair, or the combustion engine. They, this, these are like one in a generation things, you know. You don't get lots of this in your lifetime, where where it changes the world. And certainly, it could be said that Apple has changed the world, you know, in the things that they've invented, and and for the better, I think. You know, I think that it's great. I know if we were in the same United States I grew up in, when I was out of town, I talked to my mom for two minutes every two weeks because it was expensive to make a long distance call. And, uh, you know, I didn't write that many letters cause it was a lot of hassle and took so long to get there and then hear back. And, you know, I, I think I'm, I keep in much better touch with my kids without being a burden to them or anything because I use their form of communication. I text, they don't talk. Kids don't talk. You could give them a phone with no phone in it and they'd be fine. Yeah. It's like, I call them once in a while. It's like, oh, you're calling by voice. How quaint. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I do think, though, that we, you know, we manage to be in touch more. I talk to, and I say talk with air quotes, but I talk to my kids every day. You know, at least once a day, a volley of text back and, back and forth, a picture of something, uh, something you heard, or, Daddy, I need something. But, you know, every day... We talk, and I feel like, you know, I'm in touch. We communicate. Is I don't wait two weeks for a phone call or a letter and, and wonder the rest of the time what's going on in their lives. And the, it's just changed the way. Look at this. We're talking on video phone. Yeah. I mean, who'd have thought when we were young that, that not, and not only are we talking on video phone, it's free. Now that, who'd have thought, huh? Yeah. You know, originally this was going to be AT&T, and they were going to charge you up the wazoo yeah. for this. <laughs> But then Skype let the toothpaste out of the tube. Well, there's so many things that they back back in those days that they got right, and so many things that they just there was no way to foresee. I mean, you know, the the, the rise of the internet and the networking you were talking about. I mean, it made perfect sense because people had a need, and it, they were still trying to figure out what those needs were, not how to fill them, but just what the needs were. But there, there was the social thing. I mean, no. I, nobody predicted that until it sort of happened. I think uh, Mark What's his name did the guy that invented Facebook, Bookface, oh, Zuckerman, Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg, <laughs> Zuckerberg. Yeah, he he predicted the rise of social media, but he's the guy that said college kids need a place where they can, you know, put their stuff and hang out. <laughs> and now we take it all for granted. I mean, you know, Twitter. It's like, who to thunk that? How many? How many characters are they? One forty, one hundred and forty characters. I think um, Strunk and White probably would like Twitter <laughs> because because their big thing was omit needless words. <laughs> well, if you're using Twitter, you damn well better, right? Yeah. 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 You don't have any to spare. It causes you, it causes you to be very terse. Um, I think it also keeps people from doing it too much, you know, because it's not easy to get your whole thought into 140 characters. It takes, you know, I think only smart people tweet. There, there you go. I don't tweet. I don't tweet. But. That, that, that should be a t-shirt there, only smart people tweet. Well, I think so, because it's so much harder to write a good 140 characters than a bad three pages. Yeah. 
you know, I've always said it's easy to write long. What's hard is editing and getting, you know, the essence of it. That's hard. I could write a thousand word article in an hour, but if you want 400 words, it's going to take me longer. Because I got to start with the thousand words probably and work my way down to what's essential. It's, it's just harder to go short. So, you know, I think Twitter is an intellectual kind of exercise. You got to get your whole point across unless you want to go multi-tweet, you know. <laughs> People who do that just don't get it. Yeah. Bob, something you told me pre-show. I'm though. anti-social media. Yeah. <laughs> something you told me though pre-show. I didn't realize that this they, there was going to be a movie made of the 30th anniversary event, which I think yes, is yes, 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 yes. The guy that the guy that staged the event, the guy that was the promoter, um, he's a, a documentary filmmaker. Is his you know like day job? He's not a, a Apple event promoter. He wanted to do this because he wanted to shoot it and and get a video, you know, get a, a movie out of it and and preserve it for all time and have it for the rest of the people who didn't get to see it. And, you know, it's just too bad that documentaries can't be seven hours long, you know. And it's too bad they didn't go on for longer, and it's too bad that there can't be an extended cut because I would buy that in a heartbeat. I would watch these guys talk for as long as they would be on camera. They were just so filled with interesting stories and observations and, like, why things are, you know, how things got that way. And the, so, the whole idea that, you know, they created it, they created it at a time that was a lot different than now. And to hear their insights into what it has become and how it has evolved, I, I, I would agree. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a perfect time at 30. And unfortunately, again, we were talking pre-show that we've already lost Steve Jobs and Jeff Raskin out of that team, and so another five and probably or, others. You know, yeah, who knows? Yeah, and out of and five or ten years, you know, just I mean, the math is going to catch up at some point. So, some of this stuff needs to be captured and, and documented. I can't wait to see the video. Yeah. I can't wait. I, I think it's going to be fantastic. And you know, <clears throat> uh, Gabriel, his his name is. Um. Gabriel Franklin, the filmmaker, uh, I, I don't envy him because having all that footage and trying to make a movie and trying to decide what goes on the cutting room floor is going to be agonizing. It's going to be very difficult because so much of it is good. You know, I, I'd say most of the three hours were worth repeating. So he's going to have a tough time whittling this down. And I don't think the band's going to be in it because... We played cover songs, and you have to pay the songwriters royalties and stuff. Sync rights, they call it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we'll be in it. But maybe. I don't know. I'm, gonna, I'm looking into it because if the sync rights can be paid when you sell copies, I want to make it available for charity. I will, we'll give our part to charity, but we'll have to make money so we can pay the sync right. right. So, you know. Uh, the guys, we've always said we'd like to, you know, release some, some of our stuff for people to listen to. The problem is we don't do our own material, so we can't. But maybe this will work out in a way that we can. Yeah. Well, and for the fans of the Macworld All-Star Band, there are places on the Internet that you can go to find, you know, the unofficial recordings. Oh, there's bootleg say. recordings. There's bootleg recordings of... I would say a good number of our shows available if you if you look carefully. I mean, YouTube. <clears throat> um, I've seen a few on YouTube. Yep. I don't want to get the copyright owners in trouble. See, the problem is any of those that's out there in the wild is going to get taken down as soon as one of the record labels hears that I'm singing Listen to Her Heart by Tom Petty yeah. <laughs> or, you know, the Beatles. That's just it. So we can't really put them out in the wild. They're circulated by collectors, though, and they're traded avidly among collectors, among all seven collectors. <laughs> that would be the band plus you. Yeah. <laughs> I think there are a few more. I think there are a few more. We have, we have, I have video of a lot of the shows. I'm not of the whole, actually, I have video of whole shows, and I have partial video of some shows, and I have songs that people have shot. So, you know, I've got pretty, I got a pretty good archive of Macworld All Star Band video, but it's mostly you know really bad footage and not very good sounding. Got a couple that were shot with decent equipment on 
And the ones that Wally does, that guy Wally, who, you know, every year has put up a couple of, of last year he did like five songs and they were amazing. You were one of the camera people, weren't you? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I helped out. It was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's the best quality stuff we've ever had. I mean, the stuff he's done. Yeah. And again, it's hard to put up, you know, it's like. It might go up on YouTube, but it will get pulled down pretty darn quick. I'm just waiting for Listen to My Heart on Facebook to get a uh, takedown notice. I put it up there. I figure, well, I don't know. What's fair use? It's only like 12-second clips, so that might be fair. Yeah, you may be able to get away with that. Well, it sounds like Maybe they event. can't tell what I'm singing. Maybe you know, nobody <laughs> will notice. It sounds like a great event, Bob. It's, it sounds like it was. That, it know. was, and I hope the I hope the video comes out soon because I, it'll make a great Christmas present next year for all my geek friends. Yeah, uh, if your geek friends don't get it first. <laughs> yeah, right. That's true. <laughs> this edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by Sanebox, the way to take control of your out of control email. For a free trial and ten dollar credit. Visit SaneBox.com slash MacVoices. Folks, I really want you to try SaneBox. No, really. Go sign up for a 14-day free trial right now at SaneBox.com slash MacVoices. I'll wait. Okay, that might take a little long. So feel free to pause the audio or video, or just pay attention while I continue on, and you go right ahead and sign up. Why is it so important? I've tried pretty much every email management software program or technique out there with wildly varying results, and I haven't found anything that even comes close to SaneBox. The first afternoon I signed up for my free trial, SaneBox cut my inbox in half. That's great, but what was really remarkable was that I didn't disagree with any of SaneBox's decisions. It left the important stuff in my inbox and moved the rest to the Sane Later folder, where all the unimportant stuff goes for you to review, either in a digest mode or manually. In the days that followed, I found a few things redirected, a confirmation of a doctor's appointment that, while important, indeed had something of a generic look to it, a few other notifications that, while they were important to me, SaneBox needed to be told they were important to me, but only once. And that's the beauty of SaneBox. It's smart out of the gate and gets smarter. And unlike some other solutions that need to be told two, three, four times or more, SaneBox gets it with one instruction. I know you're skeptical. I was skeptical too. So don't believe me. Try it for yourself. SaneBox.com slash MacVoices gets you the 14-day free trial as well as a $10 credit. I know. How much will this magic cost me? SaneBox plans start at $2.04 a month. That's the per month price, and I promise you that the time you save the first day before breakfast will more than pay for the month. So if you didn't do what I told you at the top of the spot, do it now. Go to SaneBox.com slash MacVoices and sign up for your free trial and get 10% credit on your SaneBox subscription. And let me know how you like it at Chuck at MacVoices.com, because I know you will like it. SaneBox. The way to take control of your out of control email. Thanks to SaneBox for sponsoring this edition of Mac Voices. Well, Bob, I, I know that there's one of the there, there are a couple other things we want to touch on, um, but one is I'm, I'm kind of interested in your feelings on the the, the whole smartwatch thing. Um, and I've, I ask this because I've been looking. There were a number of them at CES. Some which really looked very geeky that, you know, I would not wear. There were a couple, though, that I could see, you know, as far as having something and putting it on with a, with a suit, that they would look okay, um, you know, and, and the pebble would have to have the right analog face on it. But there were a couple options, too, where, you know, and, and they've been laughing about this, that, you know, it's going to be like Dick Tracy. You're going to be able to, to talk to your watch. Well, I don't want to talk to Why my would you want to do that? I, well, What's wrong with a Bluetooth headset? I mean, they're so unobtrusive. They're little and unobtrusive, and they work great. And, exactly. you know, you don't look that geeky. They're kind of 
subdued. They're not as geeky as wearing Google Glass in public. Yeah, and and they're not. And they're and talking into your wrist is certainly lame. Well, and that's now that's really geeky. You know, I I mean, and to and to have a speaker built into my watch so that everybody around me can hear the conversation. No, I, I I want a shoe phone like Max Smart hat. <laughs> Ooh, um, crash. Um, so. I have a friend who works. I have a friend who's a real geek. He's a you know programmer. Works at IBM. Thirty year IBM guy. He's he's you know geek through and through, and he's got a Pebble and he likes it. And I said, why? And he said, because it's geeky. <laughs> I mean, it's not like it does anything in his life that that's helping him you know get through his day better or faster or without with less hassle, and that's what I don't get. It's like I I like watches. And, and I would wear a watch that had functions that, that made my day better, that made it easier for me to do something or that made it um, more convenient to do something. But so far, I haven't seen any of that in a watch. You know, I, I think if Apple came out with a watch that was um, the, the grokked the iPhone and iPad and Mac, that might work, you know. That that might have some elements that would make it worth wearing for me. But just to just to be able to hear phone calls or see phone calls or even just see the text messages, I mean, that might be good. But I don't think that's enough to wear an ugly watch. So I'm not. I, I'm in no big hurry, and I didn't even bother to uh, review the first batch because I read everybody else's reviews, and I said, you know, I just hate having to spend that much time with something only to say I would never use this. There, you know, I like reviewing stuff that I would use and that I do use because then I can tell you about it. But if, I'm, if I've got something that I'm using because I have to write a review, it, it's like, it's work, you know, it's drudgery. And I thought I'd wait, I'd wait until, I, until somebody came out with one that had a feature I wanted. And so far, nobody's done that. Samsung Stalker Watch. I don't know about that one. <laughs> Well, that looks like you strapped a 60s remote control to your wrist. Um, it does, doesn't it? Oh, man. Bob, uh, That's okay. the Dick Tracy phone. It's big and boxy. And yeah. Thick. So so tell me, what would your top, what would be three features that would cause you to put a smartphone of of some design on your wrist? I'll tell you what. If I could get Notification Center to to be fine grained enough that I could say what notifications I wanted to see on the, on the watch and what ones I didn't and from who so that I could have important stuff on my wrist, even when my phone's in the office and I'm in the kitchen, that'd be awesome. Cause I have to carry my phone around with me all the time to see who. So anything that would keep me, keep the phone in my pocket more would be good. But so far nobody's got that where it's controllable enough that my wrist wouldn't drive me crazy. You know, with my phone, I can assign ringtones to people so I know who's calling. I can uh, have different tones for different kinds of events. And, and because of that, I can tell without taking it out of my pocket whether I need to look. And that's half the job. The other half would be getting it on the wrist if it were important. So that's a big feature. If I could get that and it were fine-tunable enough, I would like that. Um, I'm not sure I'd like the camera in here. I mean, I don't think I'd want to point my wrist at things to shoot. I'm pretty happy with the phone. The phone actually is a, has a pretty good form factor for shooting with. I mean, if you're going to shoot with a bar of soap, it's a good-sized bar of soap with a button in a good place. I'm serious. It, yeah, it's not yeah. bad, and I'm getting used to it. And I have stuff like this. I have a bunch of stuff like this, but this is like my, <laughs> it's my Steadicam. Yeah. Right? Hey. You want to do a tracking shot? Heck yeah. Just slap that phone in there and I'm a, I'm a tracking shot. Ooh. And it, this really does stabilize it. And I can shoot pretty good handheld video like that. You know, so I'm not that interested in having the camera be in my watch, although a microphone in the watch might be good. Not for phone calls and stuff, but for recording stuff so that you could like go to a, um, uh, I go to, um, like if I go to a press conference or something and I want to take notes, a lot of times I'll use my MacBook Pro and run Word, which has this great notebook view that nobody knows about where you can record audio and type notes. 
and they stay synchronized. So, you know, the guy says, one million units. You type one million units. You can find that in the audio by clicking on one million units that you type. Or he says, broke all records. Type that, and that's where it is. So, you know, it's really easy to get back and forth in the audio, mm. which is always a problem. It's like if I, tape, if I just do audio, I won't transcribe it, and I'll only listen to it if I can't remember something. And then I have to listen to the whole thing. And I can't, you know, figure out where exactly it was. Um, with, with Word, I'm recording and taking notes. So I think if I could record, it doesn't really matter that much because I can do it on my iPad, my iPhone, and my MacBook Pro. I don't, I don't even know what I'd want to watch for. I'll tell you who I think will want them, though, is people who wear fitness tracking things. They wear a Fitbit or they wear a, a, a Up. Uh, they're tracking their steps. They're tracking their pulse, their heart rate, their respiration, whatever. Uh, I think those kind of people might want to watch that could do stuff like that. And I think maybe if you're a competitive athlete, you'd want to watch that could, you know, like time your time your splits and runs and send it to the website and, you know, do all kinds of groovy stuff with your health data. But I, I'm not – I'm just not that healthy. <laughs> Are you a watch guy, Bob? I am, but I like watches. I mean, I like watches that – are either uh, stylish in some way, you know, the, the design gets, gets my attention, or are functional in some way. I love G-Shock watches, Casio G-Shock watches, because you can throw them at the wall, you can step on them, you can run over them with your car, you can jump in the pool, and they don't break. And for me, that's a very, very good feature, because I'm really rough on watches. Uh, so, you know, that they are one of my favorites. I must have five G-Shock watches. You know, I get a, see a new design, it's like, ooh, I really think I... And I have, you know, different colors for different outfits that I wear. I'm kidding. I only wear black. <laughs> I was going I was gonna let it go, but I wasn't sure about that. But, you know, I have dress watches. I have play watches. I have digital watches. I have regular watches. I have this watch, which glows in the dark, which is my movie-going watch. <laughs> Because it's not real obvious when you look at your wrist if your wrist glows, but it's really obvious if you pull your phone on and turn it on because your face gets bathed in white and everybody around you goes, oh. Yeah. But, uh, but so you're not a Rolex kind of guy. You're more a functional watch kind of guy. No, I don't buy expensive watches. Um, I just, I'm too rough on them. You know, even if I've had one, I probably wouldn't wear I'd be afraid to wear it because I break them. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'd say I, my limit for a watch is two or 300 bucks. And that's a lot. A lot of my watches are 70 to 50 $20, you know. I like Timexes. I like G-Shocks. And I love this Luminox. This is the Navy SEAL watch. Glows in the dark. Mm -hmm. And it's very green. Luminox? Very green, yeah. Okay. Hmm. And it's got, so all of the pieces that light up, the two, the two little elements in the hands and all the markers, are electroluminescent, but they're battery, uh, they're, they run off the battery. They run, they're gas charged, something that it's a fluorescent gas that requires a very tiny trickle of electricity. The idea is if you're a Navy SEAL and you're under 60 feet of water, it's dark down there. You can't put your watch up to a light to charge the, the reflective stuff. You know, it's got to glow in the real dark. So they, they invented this for, you know, like Navy SEALs and stuff. And I decided at my age, uh, with, with eyes that are getting worse and worse and worse, I need a really bright glow-in-the-dark watch if I'm going to just glance at my wrist and know that the movie should be over in 20 minutes. Interesting choice. <laughs> Plus, the numbers are really big. Can you see those? The yeah. numbers uh, are really big. Yeah. And the, you, get a, you get a little older, you'll understand. <laughs> And I'll make sure I have a link in the show notes to Luminex. Is that Luminox? The? Yeah, Luminox. Luminox. Okay. I'll. Um, it's on my wish list on Amazon. If I remember, I'll send you a link to it. Okay, I'll find it. I'll find it one way or the other. They've got lots. They. They all. They. I think all of their watches have this feature, but if not, most of them. All the Navy Seal ones. Anyone that says Navy Seal in its name does. Yeah. But I think that's their trademark. Like every watch has it. Pretty cool, though. You can leave the watch in a drawer for three days, and when you open it up, if you're in a dark room, it's glowing. It's still glowing. I, I, I'm really intrigued by your, your comments about the watch. I think that I, I agree with all of them. Uh, I've, I would like to have access to information 
Now, I don't know, hopefully the mic didn't pick it up, but my phone just chimed in my pocket. I don't know why it I chimed it. in my pocket. Okay. I heard it. Okay, so... I thought you, it was mine, but I know that I'm on silent mode. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, what? what is that? Is that a text message? Is it something quasi-urgent, or is it, you know, something automated, or, you know, what What was it? That would be nice to be able to just, you know, do a quick glance and say, oh, you know, that's that's it. Um, and it would be nice to have macros to send back. If you got a text message, it'd be nice to be able to do your, I'll call you later, I'm busy, or yeah, yeah. I'll be home in an hour, on my way, you know, all the little things that we do with shortcuts or Siri. Be nice to be able to do that with your wrist. How about, like, uh, can't talk now. Shake, shake, shake. Right. Message sent. Okay, so there's a question. Sh- should we sh- should a smartwatch integrate Siri? I mean, we're back to that talking to your watch thing, but that's a little bit different category than having a conversation. I, you know, I think maybe having the microphone would be okay, so that you could use Siri while sh- while this is in your pocket. But then, how are you going to hear her? That's why I think the the Bluetooth, you know, the Bluetooth solution, hey, it already works. It's already affordable. It's, you know, pretty proven technology. They've got really good noise-canceling ones now. They're getting cheaper every day. The only problem with these darn things is they're so small, I lose them. Yeah. And they're they're pricey. Yeah, they're, price, tell you. they're pricey to lose them, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you, you buy one in a lifetime, it's not a big deal. But if you buy two a year, which is pretty much what my average is, And it's really hard. Once you get used to having one, it's really hard to do without it. Yes. I don't like talking on my phone as a phone. It's like if I'm going to talk, even sometimes at home, I'll toss on the headset because it's easier. And the wired headset's okay. But it's always, you know, finding it and untangling it. Oh, no. I've got this right on my desk. Clamp it on my ear and go. And it's the first thing I do when I get in the car. You know. It's convenient. You put the earpiece in and... Well, not only is it convenient, but it's safe. Yes, it is. Yeah. And I use Siri almost exclusively in the car. I've got a, a mount that the, the, this thing is called the Satichi CD mount. It goes in the CD slot in your car for your mm-hmm. slot-loading CD player, which you never use, do you? No, I don't use mine. So it's great. And it holds your phone right there, which is the perfect place. It's where the um, navigation system would have been if I had spent three grand. Right there, you know? So it holds it right there perfectly. It's got the headset in. And really, I don't ever have to look at the screen. You know, usually I can get, I can do everything I need to do with voice only without even looking. Right. Navigation, sometimes I'll look at the map and see what's coming. But for like a text message, I can say it. She reads it back to me. She says, do you want me to send it? I could do it all with voice. And in a car, I believe that's a lot safer than yeah. touching your phone. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Whether so, but I don't know. I don't see where a watch comes into that. You know, it's like it's a stretch to make the watch the the conduit for voice. That's what I think. I think well, you're stretching it to make that the conduit because it's got to go in your ear. You got to hear it. You got to get the feedback. You know, yeah. put a speaker in there, then you're sharing your your Siri stuff with everybody. I asked her the other day if she knew her from the movie Her. And you know what she said? Is that you, Joaquin? <laughs> really? She's got a great sense of humor. Yes, mm. she does. Mm. I asked her another time, and she said, no, but some of my best friends are fictional characters. <laughs> uh, the people at Apple have a sense of humor. Or Siri does. I, I'm not convinced that Siri's not real. <laughs> Oh, jeez. That's, let's not go there. That's, that's dangerous territory. Let's, I asked her what she was wearing the other day. Uh-oh. <laughs> Have you ever tried that? Mm, that's fun. <laughs> the latest in this, polycarbonate and silicone. <laughs> this is a family show, Bob. Be careful. <laughs> hey, let's talk about your TV show you, or video show, whatever, however you're characterizing it. I call it the BobLevitas.tv show because I bought the domain BobLevitas.tv and darn it, I'm getting my money's worth. (laughs) But yeah, it it might not be on real TV. Um, I I have no idea how it'll end up getting distributed, but I know what the content will be. And the content will be 
really the kind of stuff we talk about, the kind of stuff that uh, you go to Macworld to see a session about, the kind of stuff that you walk a, show, a trade show floor, the kind of stuff you go to Fry's and roam the aisles looking for. Um, it's, you know, apps and, and shortcuts and tips and troubleshooting and what to do when this happens and uh, interviews with people who do stuff, cool stuff in the technology field and new technology products like smartwatches. Who knows? But I hope to have an episode ready around um, Macworld time. That's kind of the deadline I've given myself, and I'm stating it publicly on purpose so that I hold to it. But I'm planning to go to Macworld with a 30-minute episode that people can see, and then we'll see. You know, I, I, I can't do it all. My, I can't do a season of TV all by myself. I could do one episode, though, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to finish that, but I'm going to need help if I'm going to try to do, say, one a week or two a month or something like that. Um, I, my company's called involuntary auteur productions. I'm an involuntary <laughs> auteur. I don't want to be everything. I want to just write it and sit in front of the camera and talk. I don't want to have to take the tapes down to the basement and edit them and grade them and color correct. And, you know, I mean, I, this is not my, that's not my idea of fun. Shooting and, and writing. Yes, but all the other stuff I would gladly let somebody else do if I could only find somebody who will do it for me. So first I got to make the demo and then I can start to look for partners. But I, I feel good about it. I, I, I've seen what I can do and I've shown it to a few people privately. And I think that this is something that just doesn't exist out there. Certainly doesn't exist on cable TV. There are podcasts that have pieces of this, but um, the whole thing about this is it's going to be 22 to 30 minutes long and it's going to be really fast paced it's not going to be like a podcast where they ramble on and on and on about something for five or six or seven minutes this is going to be you know tight uh scripted two and three minute bits you know like how to make uh this is one that i'm working on now how to make a ringtone in garage band under five minutes you watch this pause it a couple times you can make your own ringtones easy 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 you know, I could write three pages about it, but you wouldn't read it. But watching a four-minute video, I think, you know, might, might be the way. I know when I say to my kids, so how do you figure out how to do this stuff? You know, you don't read my books, do you? Because, you know, I put your pictures in there. And they're going, really? Where? <laughs> I said, see, I knew you didn't read them. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but the thing is, I said, where do you learn this stuff? Like, where do you learn how to use Photoshop? Where do you learn how to remove a blemish in Photoshop? Somebody's got a blemish on their face. How do you learn what tools to use? And oh, I go to YouTube and watch a video. So I, I, I'm thinking, you know, in my estimation, the, peop the market of people who buy paperback and hardcover books and read them to learn how to do things is, is dying. You know, it's my generation. But the next generation, they don't read as much. They, they watch TV or they look it up on the internet or they want to see a clip of film or they want an integrated multimedia presentation with instructions and video. And, and I, I really see it going in that direction more and more. You know, it's like right now I'm in a, the enviable position that Apple's target market happens to also be a book buying market. You know, it's, it's the older. The, the Apple's selling a lot of product to kids. And they're learning about it. They're not buying my book. But the bulk of it is over 30s and, and probably over 40s. And they are buying books. But as they get older, there's going to be less and less book and more and more video. And I really believe that, you know, if I want to control my own destiny, I need to start making content that's video now, even if I can't make a lot of money at it now. It's like I got to get my that brand established. Um, because what I'm, what I'm going to do isn't that unique. It's my take on it that's unique, and that's what makes it unique. It's like anybody could talk about an app on TV. Anybody could demo an app. But, you know, I'm going to put together 30 minutes that I hope will be interesting to a lot of people like you or me or, you know, the people that we hang out with at user group meetings and Macworld. And, and, and I know there's a lot more. You know, it's like I know a lot of people that have seen me give a presentation say, I would never have gone to a user group meeting. 
And I would never have come out to see a computer geek speak, but that was fun. That's the thing. You know, I know how to do that, and I think I can do it for TV, and I think it'll be really fun to do that way. And certainly after writing 70 books, um, I'm ready for, you know, a, something else, a little challenge. Sure. Well, if you, you're Stay evolving. tuned. Yeah, you're evolving just like the Mac did, just I'm, like we all have had to. I'm evolving. That's right. I'm a monkey. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that that's devolving. I'm devolving. Yeah. I just want the audience to see my T-shirt. Yep. This was last year's Cirque du Mac T-shirt. I have one of those the in my closet. Greatest party on earth. Yep. And I, I, it's, I think it's a fair bet that there'll be another Cirque du Mac this year. Um, although uh, he, he said so. Dave actually said so on, I believe, Leo's podcast. Okay. And so if okay. he said it on a podcast, it's he can't back out now. Yeah. He's actually... I do know that he's in the process of lining up advertising support, and you know, he's managed to pull it together ten years in a row so far. I think we can be pretty comfortable that it'll be eleven. As a matter of fact, I saw an email today. We are choosing our songs as as we speak. So, yeah, I don't think we'd go to that trouble if there wasn't going to be a Cirque du Mac. Yeah, and you'll be at Mac World, I World, of course, too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. How could you not? Yes. With your, with I don't your, work anymore, though. I don't, I'm not doing any sessions. I might do a bird of a feather or something. I'll do whatever Paul wants. I mean, I, I'm happy to do him a favor. But it's just got to be so much, too much for me to prepare for a session and do all that extra stuff and have to be anywhere. And like, now I get to go to Macworld. And, um, my daughter's coming. And we're, I, I'll probably go great. for a day. And spend the rest of the time hanging out in San Francisco with all my geeky friends that'll be there. Uh, I don't need, you know, three days of sessions every day and, you know, getting to the keynote at 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to San Francisco to have a nice time. I'm going to go relax. My band's playing. I'm going to a party Friday night. I'm going to Macworld for a couple of days. It's different than it used to be, but it's still fun. That's, and that's the key. That's you know, I, I'm still not at a point where I'm going to say I'm not going. You know, I still really look forward to it, and it's one of the high points of my year. Along with my um, Mid-Atlantic tour, and I will be making my whatever umpteenth Mid-Atlantic tour this year. I just talked to Maria, and I am on my way. I'm coming your way. Yep. Yeah. First week of May. So, and I think the confirmed groups are uh, the mainline group in Philly, um, Princeton, of course, and, you, and Hershey Applecore. So, yeah, we'll, we are already it's the hardcore. To it. The hardcore. I've I've done those three groups probably for the last seven or eight years in a row. There's been a couple others that have come and gone. I've done Washington some years. I did another New Jersey group one year, but that's my core. The Mid Atlantic to me means Philadelphia, Princeton, and Hershey. Well, that's great. Well, and folks, you can mark it down. You know, that's uh, that's. I'll usually, be there. Usually, the May meetings of those groups. Yeah, so. the May. It's the first week of May. I'm I'm yeah. away over the Mother's Day weekend, so user group meetings within a few days of either side of that. Great. Well, I look forward to seeing you at MacWorld in San Francisco, and of course at Hershey at, at my group. And uh, I'm sure other people would be looking forward to the Mid Atlantic Mug Tour. And if you see Doctor Mac wandering the aisles of MacWorld iWorld. Shake hands and say hello. I don't bite much. I, I, I didn't think you did. I think you did. Bob, it's great to talk to you. We'll do it again. And you too, Chuck. Thanks for having me. All right. Good to see you. You too. Folks, this is Mac Notables on Mac Voices. I, I'm not sure what Bob's doing now. <laughs> He's playing. He can't resist. Until the next time, uh, thanks for listening. We will be back again soon. Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, app.net, Google+, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date with all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. See me. I'm an X-ray. <laughs>